Funding for In the Garden is provided by Academic Programs and North Carolina Cooperative Extension. Both are members of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at North Carolina State University. And by UNC TV viewers like you. Hello, and welcome to In the Garden. I'm Bryce Lane, and folks, today we're going to talk about propagating plants from seed. That's right. Can you go out in your own garden, collect seed, bring them in, and treat them in such a way that you can have plants from those seeds? You remember last week we discussed how plants reproduce sexually. Well, we're going to take that information and apply it to seed propagation. Of course, before we do that, we really need to understand what a seed is. So let's go do that. What I've done here is put a diagram on the board of a mature flower ovary. That's right, the flower pistil, most of its parts dissipate once fertilization has occurred, except for the ovary. And the ovary is what becomes what we know as the fruit. A fruit is a mature flower ovary that houses the seeds. Okay, the seeds. Let's talk about propagating plants from seed. Where do we start? We start with this question. What is a seed? Well, if you look in plant science books, the definition of seed goes something like this. It's a miniature plant surrounded by a protective covering called a seed coat. That's right, it's an entire plant, but in miniature. So if you take 100 seeds and put them in a small bag, you're really carrying around 100 separate plants. It's that complete what's inside that seed. Basically, you could call it a plant embryo. Now, I've kind of coined my own definition. It's kind of cute, at least I think so. You might not, but I say it's a plant in a nutshell. Basically, you've got a whole plant surrounded by a seed coat that you can use to store plants and take care of plants. If we look at a diagram, and please don't be worried by all these terms, I'm more concerned that you get a feel for what's going on inside the seed. But if you look at the seed, you'll notice that it has a shoot, it has a root, all the parts that a normal plant would have, but then it's supported by this larger area here, which is called the cotyledon. Now the cotyledon is nothing more than stored food that feeds this young plant when it begins to germinate in the soil. Okay, knowing that, there are some seed terms we need to be aware of as we talk about propagation of plants. The first is seed viability. Now, the term seed viability really means a seed that will germinate and grow normally. You see, we can't just say that seeds are alive, because any seed that's respiring is alive. But the seeds that we really want to use are those that are viable. See, not all seeds that are alive will germinate and grow normally. And what you really want to have is those viable seeds that will germinate and grow normally into a plant. The second term is called seed longevity. You've almost figured out what that is. How long a seed remains viable. You see, the storage capacity of the cotyledon influences how long the seed remains viable, germinate and grow normally. And that longevity is affected by a number of different things. Take species, for instance. Most of your vegetable garden plants generally have a longevity of about one to two years, where your woody species, it tends to be three to five years. The other thing that influences longevity is storage conditions, and this is where it's really important for us that like to store our seeds. Folks, don't put them in the freezer. The optimal storage conditions are 30 to 40 percent relative humidity and 40 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. The best place you can store your seeds is in the refrigerator, all right? That's the best storage spot for seeds to help increase their longevity. Some very important terms for propagating plants by seed. 
Now, folks, this is a lotus seed pod, and lotus is Nelumbo nucifera. Look at the seeds in the pod. Isn't that neat? You might be asking yourself, well, what does this have to do with seed viability and seed longevity? Well, if you're wondering how long seeds could possibly remain viable, remember I said it depends a lot on species? Well, this lotus is a perfect example. Scientists found some lotus seeds on a dry lake bed in Manchuria, China, and collected those seeds and began to germinate them. Once they germinated some of those seeds, they used carbon dating to determine how old the seeds were. And guess what? One of the seeds was almost 1,300 years old, and it still germinated. It's incredible, the right storage conditions and the species. Now, the bad news is that particular seedling died. It didn't last more than a few days. But scientists are cultivating other seeds of lotus, 300, 400, 500 years old, and are able to get them to germinate and grow normally. So here's a great example of how species and storage conditions influences longevity. Well, what factors are necessary for successful germination of seeds? I mean, if you were going to collect some of your own seeds from your garden to plant them and get them to germinate, what would be necessary for them to actually germinate? Well, there are a number of factors that are required. And the first one is that the seeds have to be ripe. Now, how are you going to know whether the seeds are ripe or not? Well, a general rule of thumb indicates that the seeds will fall to the ground either inside the fruit or by themselves, and at that point in time you would know that they were ripe. Now this is Euscaphus japonicus, and we've talked about this tree before, and it has an interesting red fruit with these black seeds. When those seeds become ripe, they'll fall to the ground. Now I've learned over the years that you can collect these seeds when the fruit begins to fade in color and they will be ripe at that time. So a little bit of experience helps you out. So that's the first one, ripeness. The second is, are these seeds viable? Will they germinate and grow normally? Well, it's difficult to determine whether a seed's viable just by looking at it. But you should look at the seed, see if it's hard, if it's fat, if it's soft, or a little bit uh, uh, compromised, then that's probably not viable. But for some seeds, there's a little test you can do. And that's why I have this glass of water here. And in my hand, I've got some Styrax japonica seeds. These are seeds from a small white flowering tree that I've collected. Well, one little test you can do to test viability would be to place the seeds you want to germinate into the water and see if they float or if they sink. Well, you can see these Styrax seeds have all sunk to the bottom. Well, that's a good sign because if the seeds are viable, then they tend to sink to the, gr to the bottom. If they're non-viable, they tend to float because you'll find air pockets in those seeds. So that's viability, ripeness and viability. Now, what about the conditions for germination? Let's take a look at this. We've got soil. You need to have a good medium for germination. A good potting soil would be excellent for germinating seeds, something that holds water well but also drains well. And I've just purchased a regular potting soil for that. But you do want to have a good soil to stimulate the germination, providing they're ripe and they're viable. Well, not only do you need soil, but you've got to have ample moisture. That's this, uh, another factor. And of course, that almost goes without saying. But for seeds to germinate, they have to imbibe or absorb water. So moisture is a second one. Another is warmth. It's really important that these seeds in their moist environment remain warm so that they will germinate. In fact, I'd like to show you this little seedling of Euscaphus. Now, sometimes it takes care of itself and you don't even have to do it all uh, alone. Uh, obviously, if a couple years ago, seeds fell to the ground here and just got underneath the soil surface. Plenty of moisture and warmth and it germinated. And now I've got this nice little Euscaphus seedling. I've already promised this seedling to a friend of mine and this winter when it goes dormant I'll dig it up put it in a pot and then keep it for them and then in the spring give it to them and they'll be able to plant them in their own landscape that's really cool now the last factor that influences germination of seeds is exposure to light Now you might be thinking yes when that seed germinates it requires light a la photosynthesis to grow but I'm talking about the seeds themselves require exposure to light to stimulate their germination have you ever experienced this in your own garden where you're using the cultivator to get rid of some weeds in between rows and you go ahead and you cultivate those weeds and get them all out and down and clean it up nicely only to find two weeks later weeds grow right back? What's happening there? 
Well, basically, those weed seeds that were down lower in the ground, unexposed to light, were brought up closer to the surface by your cultivation, and that exposure to light stimulated their germination. As a kid, my dad would help me plant the garden with beans, and I always planted them real deep because I didn't want them to escape, and they were so deep, those guys didn't germinate. My dad's rows were all uniform, and mine were horrible. So you see, these are all factors that influence the successful germination of seeds. Well, being that that seed would receive all those things for germination, what if they still don't germinate? I mean, what could be going on? Well, believe it or not, folks, temperate plant seeds also can have a dormancy. Here we go with dormancy again. In this case, we're talking about temperate plant seed dormancy. Two types of dormancy in temperate plant seeds. You see, these temperate plants have this built-in dormancy system set up for the seeds such that they'll be protected during that winter after they've become ripe and fallen on the ground. But there are two types of dormancy. The first type of dormancy is what we call a physical dormancy. This is a situation where the seed coat will not allow water in, and that seed can't germinate unless it absorbs water. The seed coat is so thick and impervious to water that it just won't germinate. The second kind of dormancy is called physiological dormancy. Now pay close attention to the spelling. Some of my students at state will write down psychological dormancy and there's no such thing as a seed that's psychologically dormant. No, it's a physiological dormancy. There's a biochemical situation going on in that seed that no matter how much water gets in, it still doesn't germinate. Physical and physiological dormancy. Well, let's talk just for a second about physical seed dormancy. How is that broken in nature? How is it that these seeds germinate in the years to come? Well, if we look at it, we see that these seeds go through a natural weathering period. Freezing, thawing, rain, snow, even birds and mammals will ingest the fruits that have these physically dormant seeds in them, and they'll run through their digestive system, compromising that seed coat. This natural weathering causes the seed coat to be compromised, and it germinates. How would we do it in the comfort of our own home? Well, it's a process that we call scarification. That's right, scarification. And in a minute, I'll show you how you can perform scarification. Now, what about physiological dormancy? Well, how is that broken in nature? Because it's a biochemical dormancy, the seeds are more in tune with the moisture they're experiencing and the temperature. That's right, exposure to differing temperature and moisture regimes result in the breaking of this physiological dormancy. Most seeds experience a warm dry spell when they're ripening, cold moist during the winter, and then a warm moist period when they germinate. How can we speed that process up in the comfort of our own home? It's a process that's called stratification. Scarification breaks physical dormancy, stratification breaks physiological dormancy. And rather than tell you how to do it, I thought it'd be a good idea to actually show you. So let's go over to the table and take a look at a little demonstration I've got set up. All right, scarification is the process that breaks physical dormancy in seeds. Now there are three basic kinds of scarification that homeowners can use. The first type is called mechanical. Scarification is a process where we somehow create or compromise the seed coat physically so that water can get in. One of the ways is to take a knife, like I've got here, a propagation knife, take a seed, and I've got some red bud seeds right down here, put the red bud seed in between your thumb and forefinger, and then with a the knife, go down and try to cut a little nick in the seed coat. Now folks, I've got a problem with this method. One, my manual dexterity is not that great. Two, I didn't even bring my glasses, and I can't see anymore that close. So how might we do this mechanical scarification without a knife? Well, one way I learned in plant propagation class was to use a file. To take the seed, again, in between your thumb and forefinger, take the file, and very, oops, see, this is a problem with, with this kind of scarification method. Mechanical is you, you lose it in your fingers, but you take the file, and very slowly, you file a nick. Of course, you've got to be careful that you don't file too much and damage the embryo. Now, you might say, well, Bryce, is there a faster, more efficient way to do this mechanical form of scarification? And there is. If you've got a coffee can, 
you can take that coffee can and you can put sandpaper all around on the inside and then what you do is you take the seeds and I'm, I'm changing here I've got some some uh, sweet shrub seeds you put them into the can with the sandpaper you close them up and then for two to four minutes compromise that seed coat with the can and the sandpaper a little bit noisy sometimes you get tired of doing it and depending on the, the, the seed coat and how thick it is will influence how effective this method is now you might be saying I'm not I don't really want to do that either isn't there a faster way that I can do lots and lots of seeds the second method of scarification is called the hot water treatment and the hot water treatment is really a very easy process to do you get a bowl you take the seeds that require scarification you put them in the bowl then you take a pot and put it on the stove and bring that water to a boil once the water gets to a boil you take the pot off the stove and let it sit for 30 seconds you're trying to get that water temperature down a little bit below 200 degrees you take the hot water and you pour it into the bowl with the seeds all right just like this and then you let the seeds soak in that water for 24 hours now remember you're not keeping these seeds on the stove simmering in the water you're using the hot water pouring it on the seeds and then letting this cool the room temperature all right and soak for 24 hours then you plant the seeds that method of scarification is called the hot water treatment it's real easy you can do lots of seeds now the third method of scarification I do not recommend at home and that's using a concentrated solution of sulfuric acid and you soak those seeds in the acid for about 20 to 30 minutes problem with that is one if you let them soak too long you don't have any seeds left and second it's a very dangerous solution to have in and around the home it'll burn your clothing your skin I think hot water or mechanical will work just fine now that's what we can do at home to scarify our seeds but what about stratification the key period for stratification is the 60 to 90 day period of cold 60 to 90 days of temperatures at 40 to 45 degrees in moist medium how might we stratify our seeds well, what I recommend is that you get a Ziploc plastic bag fill it with peat moss peat moss is a media that absorbs a lot of water and holds it and so it works real well to hold moisture so this becomes our little stratification unit now what you do is you open up the bag and you take the seeds that require stratification and you put them in the bag down into that moist peat moss and that ensures the fact that they will absorb moisture you close the bag up and now you need to expose this unit to 60 to 90 days at 40 to 45 degrees best place to put it you guessed it right back into the refrigerator hold it there for 60 to 90 days and at the end of that period then you would go ahead and remove those seeds plant them in the pots put them up on your windowsill and they begin to grow the dormancy period had been broken by that stratification so that's stratification and it's a real simple thing to do with a ziploc bag and peat moss now one question is there are some seeds that are physically dormant and physiologically dormant we call that double dormancy what do we do with that which one should we do first well folks double dormant seeds must be scarified first and then stratified if you don't scarify them then the water can't get in and work on the biochemistry of the seed so remember scarify first and then stratify for doubly dormant seeds now many of you are all excited about this and are thinking about oh, I'm gonna go out and do this but how do I know which plants have what kind of dormancy relative to their seeds well there's a great reference that I'd like to recommend it's called the reference manual of woody plant propagation and it's by Michael Durr and Charles Hauser and it's varsity press you can see by this book I use it quite a bit but this is a great book because it's listed by species and scientific names and it tells how to go about propagating when seeds have certain dormancies and gives you a step-by-step -step instruction on how to take care of that so it's a great book for breaking the dormancy of seeds as well as other kinds of propagation too well this is scarification stratification not too difficult you might dare to try propagating your own plants at home from seed well folks there are wonderful opportunities for propagating plants from seed 
not only from your own garden, but gardens of your friends, botanical gardens, public gardens. It's just wonderful the opportunities that you have once you understand dormancy requirements in seeds and what is required for seeds to germinate. Common plants like Japanese maples and red maples are easily propagated from seed once we understand that they require stratification. Oaks also, you can collect those acorns, and it's kind of nice to be able to say, I grew that plant from seed. Well, common plants work real well. Say dogwood, for instance. I've got some dogwood fruit right here in my hand, and these dogwoods, you find out that you need to clean or wash that fruit off, exposing the seed, and once you've exposed those seeds, those dogwoods require a 60 to 90 day period of stratification. So that ends up being a good way to propagate dogwoods. And you might be wondering, will it look just like the dogwood that I collected the seed from? Well, the exciting thing about propagating plants from seed, since it's genetic recombination through sexual reproduction, is that you might get a little bit of variation. That's kind of exciting. You might get a dogwood that's got a slightly bigger flower, or maybe a, a flower that's got a little bit of pink coloration. It's really kind of exciting to do that and then select out those plants that you really like. In addition, there are some plants that are unique and different. This is a plant called Sinocalicanthus. It's an Asian sweet shrub. And I've collected seeds from this particular plant. They're in these big brown fruit pods with the seeds all on the inside. And there they are there. You pull the seeds out and apply the proper scarification and stratification treatment. And you can get some variations on this particular sweet shrub, which has beautiful white flowers in the springtime. So you see there are a number of different kinds of plants that you can collect seeds from and propagate them. And it's actually a little bit more exciting than going to the garden center and purchasing those plants. But you know, there's one other plant that I'd like to show you. Why don't you come here and follow me? Well, the last plant that I'd like to show you is this tree right here. This is Styrax japonica, Japanese snowbell tree. And this particular cultivar is called Snowball. And it's called Snowball because it has two things. One, lots of white flowers in April and an oblong habit of growth. This plant has been introduced by the J.C. Ralston Arboretum and is now somewhat available in the nursery trade. Great cultivar. But you know, sometimes rather than go out and find the same cultivar, you go ahead and collect seeds from these plants treat them correctly, and then grow up seedlings, and then select out those seedlings that resemble the parent, and then use those for the landscape. And so if you were going to do that, you could come, and you can see the plant has got its produced fruit with seeds. I'm going to take out another storage bag. I've written Styrax japonicus right on the front. And this is one of the fun activities in the fall, is to go through and pick them off. Now I can tell the difference between one that's ripe and one that's not based on the fact that the fruit starts to shrivel a little bit and that's come from some experience. And I'll just go ahead and continue to to pick these and put them in the bag. Collect, oh I don't know, I'll probably collect 50 or 60 seeds, get some pots with media. After I've stratified these seeds, go ahead and plant them out and then grow them out. Now, it might take a couple of years to grow them out and take a look to see which ones resemble the parent the most, and then select out those plants, plant them in the landscape as if you had purchased it from a garden center. It's just a lot of fun if you've got time and you're interested in sexual reproduction of plants. To do it from seeds is real easy and a whole lot of fun. Well, the plant of the week is Osmanthus heterophilus goshiki. And although it looks like a holly, it's not. Osmanthus leaves resemble holly leaves, but the flowers and fruits are totally different. Osmanthus heterophilus goshiki comes from Japan. And goshiki means five colors. If you take a look at the leaves, you can see the multicolor nature of the leaves. When they emerge, they come out pink and bronze, and then they turn a little cream colored to green and then yellow and green. Therefore, it gets that name Goshiki. Now, Osmanthus heterophilus Goshiki grows about 8 to 10 feet tall with a similar spread. And what's great about this plant is it'll tolerate a little bit of shade. It makes a great screen, and because the leaves are so spiny, it wouldn't make a bad barrier as well. Now, the other thing, folks, about this plant that I really like is that it does produce flowers. Now, most Osmanthus, plants in the genus Osmanthus, produce flowers in the fall, usually September and well into October and they're quite fragrant. In fact, Osmanthus 
Fortunii is a plant that has just incredibly fragrant flowers. But Goshiki will produce those flowers, and that's an added aspect to this particular plant for the landscape. Now, there are other cultivars of Osmanthus heterophilus that you might consider. This one here is Osmanthus heterophilus gulf tide, and it'll grow 10 to 12, maybe even 15 feet tall. But you can see by the look of this plant that it's more upright and not spreading. So here you've got Goshiki, which has the unique colored foliage, Gulf Tide, which tends to be more upright. It would work well in a formal landscape or in an entryway. Both plants produce those fragrant fall flowers. Good woody landscape plants for your landscape. So the plant of the week, Osmanthus heterophilus Goshiki. Well, folks, we're about out of time. So until next week, I'll be looking for you in the garden. To register for In the Garden, the course, call NC State's Distance Education Program at 1-866-GO-STATE. That's 1-866-467-8283. Or log on to distance.ncsu.edu. For more information about the program or to suggest a plant of the week, go to unctv.org slash in the garden. Funding for In the Garden is provided by Academic Programs and North Carolina Cooperative Extension. Both are members of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at North Carolina State University. And by UNC-TV viewers like you.